Formula 1 fans of a certain age will tell you about the characters of previous heroes. From the playboy womanizer James Hunt to Alan Prost the Professor, every big time driver has a story to tell. Especially back in the 50s and 60s, the fastest men and women on earth had second talents or things outside of motorsport. For example, the first Spanish podium finisher in F1 history, Alfonso de Portago, was an aristocrat and also an Olympic bobsled athlete alongside being a racing driver. However, these multifaceted types of competitors died out in the F1 as the decades passed. At the start of the 1980s, drivers were becoming just that, only drivers from their youth and for their entire career. However, there were some exceptions. Here, I'm going to detail one of them. Let me tell you the story of Elio De Angelis, the most underrated driver in F1 history. Elio De Angelis was born on the 26th of March 1958 in Rome, Italy. His dad, Giulio, was a world champion powerboat racer in the 1960s and 70s, and after spending some time in go-karts during his teenage years, he drove in Italian Formula 3 in 1977, at the age of 19. He won four of the 13 races that season and beat Pierre Carlo Ginzani to the title by one point. He also competed in the European Formula 3 series, getting four fastest laps, two pole positions and a winner at Enepagusa. 1978 saw him compete in European F2 but scored no major results and finished 14th in the standings on only four points. Despite this, he did compete in one round of the British Formula 1 championship and got third in that round at Brands Hatch. He also won the Monaco F3 race that year. He had actually been eyed up for a seat in F1 by Enzo Ferrari at the end of 1977, going as far to test for the team at Fiorano, but they instead opted for Gilles Villeneuve. De Angelis made his F1 debut in 1979, driving for the ailing Shadow team. Initially a chassis builder who sold cars to other teams in a similar vein to March and Hesketh, Shadow hadn't seen much in the way of results since Alan Jones won the 1977 Austrian Grand Prix driving their chassis. However, De Angelis impressed as while his teammate Jan Lammers achieved the best result of 9th place, the plucky Italian got two 7th places in Buenos Aires and Long Beach respectively, then of the season finale in Watkins Glen, he scored an impressive 4th place, giving him 3 points and placing him joint 15th in the standings. More importantly, he'd been spotted as a driver with high potential by Lotus team principal Colin Chapman. Lotus were recent drivers and constructors champions in 1978 thanks to Mario Andretti, but they'd fallen down the order thanks partially to Chapman's waning interest in racing and his other projects, and partially as they moved into the 1980 season due to the questioned legality of the innovative 88 chassis. I covered parts of this topic in an interesting video I made about Chapman if you'd like to check it out in the top right corner of your screen. I won't get into the inner details of the Lotus 88, but essentially due to the rapid advancement in ground effect technology, the governing body of Formula 1 banned side skirts which sealed the suction effect from the air going underneath the car into an area of low pressure. As a result, the newer ground effect cars were more susceptible to changes in downforce on bumpy circuits and in general provided a bad ride quality for the drivers. So, Chapman being the clever innovator he was developed an idea to improve ride quality and make sure that the aluminium frame of the car didn't bend or warp under the sheer amount of downforce produced. He created a system where the car had two separate chassis. One was the inner chassis where the driver sat and the outer chassis was designed to take the brunt of the ground effect. The inner chassis was completely unrelated and unaffected by any movements in the outer chassis. So even if they were driving on streets in Monaco or Detroit, the driver would feel as if the road was smoother than the bottom of Gary Brabham's favourite child. Anyway, back to De Angelis. The 88 chassis being banned was a big blow for Lotus and with the much less competitive 81 chassis, expectations were low. Despite this, he impressed. For the second round of the season at the last F1 race held at the old layout of Interlagos, Elio qualified 7th, more than a second clear of his teammate Mario Andretti, then finished 2nd and on the podium on race day. A flurry of crashes and mechanical retirements halted his progress in the next few races, then De Angelis got a 6th at the Oesterac ring, retired at Zandvoort, got 4th at his home race in Imola, 10th in Canada, then another 4th at Watkins Glen. He outscored Andretti 13-1 to and massively impressed. Going into 1981, Lotus tried again and failed again to implement their 88 chassis into the sport and they'd also lost Andretti to Alfa Romeo, so they signed Nigel Mansell who'd driven a third car for them in a few races in 1980. De Angelis doubled his points scoring record from the previous season by getting a top 6 in 8 races instead of 4. He got a best result of 4th in Monza, 4 5th places in Brazil, Belgium, Spain and the Netherlands and 3 6th places in Argentina, France and Canada. He outscored Mansell 14-8 as although the Brit got a podium in Zolder, he only scored points in two other races in 1981. For 1982, Lotus became more competitive and in the first half of the season, Elio picked up consistent points. 
Also, on a side note, he was an integral part of the story of the Feast of Folk War, as when all the drivers got together and stayed in the same hotel room with mattresses strewn across the floor at the first race in South Africa, it was him and Gilles Villeneuve who took it in terms playing the piano to keep the other drivers entertained. On the racetrack itself, as I said, he picked up consistent point scores, with 5th in Long Beach, 4th in Zolder on the weekend Villeneuve was killed, 5th in Monaco in the race nobody wanted to win, 4th in Montreal in the race where Ricardo Paletti was killed, and 4th at Brands Hatch. These results were interspersed with retirements, as usual, but De Angelis took his first Grand Prix win at the Austrian Grand Prix by holding off a charging Keke Rosberg by only 0.05 seconds. He also scored 6th at Dijon for the Swiss Grand Prix. He outscored Mantle again, this time 27-3, as he scored points three and a half times as frequently as the Brit. 1983 was a less successful year for the Lotus team as a whole, as they switched from the Ford Cosworth DFV engine to Renault Turbo units, and Elio only finished in the top six once, with fifth in Monza. He only finished two out of the 15 races that season, and was outscored this time by Mansell, but did also get his first F1 pole position at Brands Hatch. 1984 saw De Angelis really show his potential, however. He scored pole position at the season opener in Yaka Paragua and finished third, and then finished from the points in every single race he finished, bar one. From round three in Zolder to round ten in Brands Hatch, he got three fifth places, two fourth places, third in Imola and Dallas, and second in Detroit. He then got four mechanical retirements in the last six races, but still finished well in the standings. He finished third on 34 points, while Mansell was only on 13. Elio was really starting to flourish, having beaten Jan Lammers convincingly, former champion Mario Andretti even more convincingly, then beaten future champion Nigel Mansell three times out of four. However, his biggest challenge yet was about to come. For 1985, Mansell was off to Williams to replace Jack Lafitte, and his Lotus seat was filled by the Brazilian hotshot Etten Senna da Silva. De Angelis' ruthless consistency started off his season well. Third of the season opener in Yaco Rapagua was followed by fourth in Estoril while Sanon won. However, Elio hit back at Imola by taking a win of his own and the second of his career. His third place in Monaco cemented his place at the top of the driver's standings, however three consecutive fifth places in Montreal, Detroit and Paul Ricard saw him fall back, even though he got pole position in the Canadian race. He wasn't classified at Silverstone, then retired with engine failure at the Nürburgring. He got two more fifth places at the Oesterach Ring in Zandvoort, then sixth at Monza. He had turbo failure at Spa, then took fifth at Brands Hatch, and an engine failure at Kyle Army. He was then disqualified from a season-ending race in Adelaide because he didn't start from the back of a grid after not getting away from his grid spot right away on the formation lap. Despite getting only one win to send us two, and the same amount of lost results that weren't his fault, he was still only five points behind the Brazilian. However, De Angelis felt the team was starting to favour Senna, and so he jumped ship to Brabham for 1986 to fill the void left by Nelson Piquet, joining the Italian's ex-teammate Nigel Mansell. The experienced Ricardo Patrese joined De Angelis at the Bernie Eccleston owned outfit, but the team was in the process of going down the pan as Bernie lost interest in team ownership, in a topic I covered in a previous video, and the 1986 chassis penned by Gordon Murray was good, but it poorly integrated the straight-forward BMW engine, creating a severely delayed throttle response. He scored 8th for the season opener in Yaka Rapagua, the third time I've said that phrase today, then had three consecutive mechanical retirements in Jerez, Imola, and Monaco. Then while the team was testing at Paul Ricard, the Angelus' car's rear wing detached and it flipped over the barriers, catching fire in the process. The initial impact of a crash wasn't life-threatening, but he couldn't escape the car unassisted. The problem was that there was hardly any track marshals at the circuit for the test, and so it took 30 minutes for a helicopter to arrive and take him to the hospital. He died 29 hours later due to smoke inhalation, having only suffered from a broken collarbone and light burns in terms of physical injuries. He was 28. De Angelis' death instigated F1 to only use a short layout of a poor record circuit until the track fell off a calendar post-1990, and his close friend Keke Rosberg retired at the end of 1986. During his career, John O'Lacy ran the same design on his helmet that De Angelis had done in tribute to his compatriot, as the Frenchman's parents were from Sicily. De Angelis is genuinely one of, if not the most underrated driver in F1 history. It's hard to exactly quantify what classifies as underrated, because some people who were around when Elio raced would attest to him being very good, whereas someone with only a casual knowledge of F1 wouldn't know anything about him and so would rate him less. It's like how some people think Prost is underrated because Senna is the only guy anyone cares about or remembers from that era, and most people rooted for Senna. Obviously historians and people with the brain who watched F1 back then and who didn't lap up the Senna documentary, know that Prost was a more well-rounded driver than Senna, and that's why Prost is in my top three drivers of all time, while Senna doesn't even get into the top five. But back to De Angelis. He beat Andretti. He beat Mansell. He was definitely world championship potential if he didn't get stuck with Brabham. He could have joined Ferrari like he so nearly did in 1977, or could have gone to another big team, really, if he showed the potential. 
It's a shame he passed away too soon to properly make good on his potential, and he's probably the last driver from the era of playboys and multifaceted rich people dabbling in motorsport and being good at it. One last thing before I go, I'm going to do a classic hot lap challenge where I take a relevant car around a relevant track. This time it's going to be me trying to beat Elio de Angelis' pole lap from the 1984 Brazilian Grand Prix. Before we get into the lap, I'll get my racing driver excuses out of the way. I hate the super turbo laggy cars of the mid 1980s because I have to mimic Senna's keyboard throttle technique so I don't spin out every 5 seconds. I've also never driven Yakura Pagua before, so I'll be learning completely from scratch. Anyways, let's see how I do. With that hot lap over, I think that's the end of the video. I hope you all enjoyed me talking about Elio De Angelis' underrated career and doing a lap in his car. Make sure to like and subscribe and tell me which topics like teams, drivers or circuits I should do in next in the comments. Big shout out also to my channel member Andy Lamberts who gets most videos earlier than everyone else, although my last video on Lewis Hamilton moving to Ferrari wasn't one of those because I was trying to jump on the bandwagon. Sorry for that, but that shouldn't deter you from giving your hard-earned money to me to ramble on about F1 from eras several decades before I was born. Anyways, I'm just going to go on and on and on, so I'll let you guys get on with your day. I'm Nedzo, and I'll see you all later. Bye!